very much, Todd. And now I would like to introduce Sandra Finley, who is going to be our moderator for this evening. Sandra? And this is Sandra. Thanks very much. Andrew Weaver is next on the program. He is the first Green Party member of the BC Legislature. You probably all know that. And indeed, he's the first provincial, uh, he's the first Green member of any province as legislature. Um, prior to his election, Andrew was the Canada Research Chair in Climate Modeling and Analysis in the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria. I could read you the list of his accomplishments, but you can find those for yourself. An outstanding contribution to all of us by Andrew Weaver is his tireless work to drive change in our attitudes to climate change. We need his science. He delivers. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, Parksville. This is a home away from home for me. Uh, my family and I have been holidaying here every summer since before our children were born which is many, many years. Um, before we break out into another song of feeding at the government trough, because that's where I am now, perhaps I, I, would, I, I would like to point out that we are, we have with us here Scott Fraser, the MLA from uh, Alberta. Uh, I apologize if there's other um, um, elected officials here that I don't, didn't see, but I did see Scott. I didn't recognize Scott. He's got, I guess it's a Movember, I'm having issues here, Movember beard as opposed to just my horrible mustache that I've got. Is there a screen going to come down at some point? Um, <laughs> So while that screen's coming down, um, what I was hoping to do is, is discuss two topics uh, that are dear to my heart recently. Not, I'm not going to go into the long details of the science of global warming, etc. But I want to address two topical things. One is the issue of natural gas and extraction, production, and transport to Asia. And the second is the transport of dilbit in our coastal waters. And I'll take the second from a science perspective and the first from an economics perspective to kind of set the stage for some of the discussions you're going to have tonight. I'll hang around. I'd love to have, answer any questions later if people have them. So the first uh, thing I'd like to start off to set the stage is where we were in British Columbia just a few years ago. We were a province that was known for its climate policy put forward under the previous Liberal administration when at the time it was Gordon Campbell as the Premier. We introduced in British Columbia the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets Act, which committed British Columbians to a 33 which committed, this isn't wrong, which committed, can you hear me out there? Yeah, yeah okay, which, which committed British Columbians to a 33% reduction by 2020 and a few other interim and post reductions as well. There were some regulations attached to that. We have the well-known Carbon Tax Act brought in in 2008 where a price was put on emissions and that price uh, was increased with time. We had the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Cap and Trade Act brought in with some regulations. This was enabling legislation that allowed uh, British Columbia to join other jurisdictions if such policies were brought in. We had the Greenhouse Gas Reduction uh, Emission Standards and Stat Statutes Amendment Act. We had the uh, Renewable and Low Carbon Fuel Requirements Act. We had uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Vehicular Standards uh, Act. We had the Local Government Green Community Statutes Amendment Act. We had the Utilities Commission Amendment Act. And we have, my favorite, the Clean Energy Act. This is not one, but a potpourri, a portfolio of policies that you can tweak and turn and tune to address emissions targets that were set in the first policy. As a collection, one would argue that these are innovative leading uh, provincial policies for the issue of greenhouse gas uh, reduction and mitigation. That's where we were, but here we are now today. Let's take a look at A, have these policies had an effect, and B, what are we doing with our policies? Well, first, it may be difficult to see this, but this is results that were published just in the last issue of the Canadian Public Policy Journal, some work done by two uh, researchers at the University of, of Ottawa, where they looked specifically uh, to what has happened to both fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions in the province of British Columbia post-implementation of carbon tax relative to other provinces. The first one here shows the fuel use 
all sorts of fossil fuel use that were subject to the BC carbon tax. Uh, the blue here showing what happened in, in, in uh, British Columbia uh, post the introduction of the carbon tax, con continuation of the decline, whereas the rest of Canada went up. This number one piece of evidence. Number two, we can look fuel by fuel at how British Columbia fared relative to the rest of Canada. The green here is British Columbia uh, use of, of oil, essentially, which went way down. Uh, it's, it's green, this is a percentage reduction relative to the rest of Canada, and other areas fell as well. We can then ask the question, did our overall emissions drop in British Columbia per capita relative to the rest of Canada since the introduction of the carbon tax and per capita emissions in British Columbia dropped about 10%, uh, I think that says, uh, uh, since the introduction of the tar carbon tax compared to about 1.1% for the rest of Canada. Dramatic effect on, on emissions reduction. So then you might say, has it hurt our economy? Like the fear mongers have said, so let's look at the data there. If you look at the GDP per capita in British Columbia relative to where we, w w relative to the rest of Canada, while in both cases since the introduction of the carbon tax time, the overall GDP has dropped ever so slightly. In British Columbia, it is substantially less than the rest of Canada. That is, we have done better than the rest of Canada. And then when we go to the countries in Europe where emissions uh, pricing has been put up in place, and we ask, has this hurt their economies? And what has happened? In every case, the economies have grown, and these are some of the most thriving, dominant economies in Europe, the Denmarks, the Northern Europe, the, the Germany, the, the Norway, the uh, etc. So there's a lot of fear-mongering out there, and there's some, some evidence that, in fact, the policy measures put in place have had a real effect. But here we go, it all starts in 2012. It starts in 2012 with a, a very simple piece of regulation that went through, hardly noticed, wherein greenhouse gas emissions associated with, or sorry, the use of uh, a natural gas in the LNG industry no longer fell within the Clean Energy Act, which was saying that we needed to get at least 93% of our power from renewable sources. It was the wedge in the dike, the crack in the wall, whatever you want to say, it's the beginning of the roller coaster of, of, or the snowball effect of all these other policies that we're starting to see now. So let's take a look at the first one. This, I like to call this the BC LNG pipeline. And I'm not going to talk about any of the economic effects of this. I'm just going to show you some of the inf information as to what the hype is, where, it come, where it's coming from, and what the lay of the land is. So here's the hype that we're exposed to. Liquefied natural gas is the industry that will make British Columbia debt free, number one. BC's liquefied natural gas to boom, a boom to fuel a $100 billion prosperity fund. LNG is going to create more than 100,000 jobs. We're looking at perhaps five big LNG plants that if built could add a trillion dollars to our GDP. Uh, and then here we're also suggesting that it could help eliminate the PST. And there's one more that just appeared two weeks ago, that we have 150 years of reserve to supply an, uh, an LNG industry for 150 years. I mean, this, you know, what, let's, this is amazing. A trillion dollar GDP, 100,000 jobs, 100 billion dollar prosperity fund, debt free and no PST, how can you not? support this. Well, of course, this was a Hail Mary pass thrown in an election campaign that was caught in the last second and now they have to deliver. So my question will be, at what cost? Because let's look at the evidence here. So where's the hype coming from? Number one, if you look at the current price of natural gas in the UK, it's about $11 per million BTU. It's about $16 per million BTU, British thermal units in Asia, and it's about $3.50 in North America. And if you subtract 16 from 350, you don't get 13, you get 1250. And I keep forgetting to change that. Um, <laughs> and just so you know, my PhD is actually in mathematics, and I, I, can't, I can't add here. But it's, it's $12.50 difference. And if you look as a function of time here, you see the one curve going up and the other curve kind of stationary going down. The going up curve is the price in Asia. The, staying, the slight decreasing curve is the one in North America. So you go, wow, look, there's a potential for our natural gas to fill this price gap. And then we have the Deputy Minister giving a presentation in 2012 to the uh, uh, Clean Energy Conference, uh, that is an annual event. And this is the projected 32-year forecast for the na natural price difference between Asia here and North America. I mean, I I've never seen anything so absurd in my entire life. You basically could have got a kindergarten kid and say, take two straight lines and draw them and make sure this it's equal distance for all time and they could do this. This is essentially saying that that price differential's gonna last for more than 30 years. Hype. Wow, okay, let's buy into this. 
And then when you go look at it, where is this price gap? What's driving it? Well, you can look at the demand, projected demand, excess demand over, over 2009 values here. So the blue here shows what is the current 2009 of these demand of natural gas by region. This circle here is red. And the yellow is the projected increase in that demand by the year 2035. So there's a projected huge increase in natural gas needed by China. And so the story goes, BC will meet that supply. Sounds good. Trillion dollar GDP, 100,000 jobs, debt free, no PSD, we all live happily thereafter. But now let's look at the inconvenient truths. And I don't want to dump you know, oil over, or whatever the expression, water over everyone's fire, but I think it's important when we have these public discourses, the dialogues, that we're honest with the evidence. And here's the evidence. Number one, let's look at total global shale gas reserves as indicated here. For those areas that are shaded in uh, light, light, white, light gray, the dark gray ones are not provided yet. The blue circles show the amount of shale gas reserves. If you look at Canada, all of Canada combined, and you compare that, say, to the US, I can't read the numbers, but it's about 2.3 times the shale gas reserves in the US than all of Canada combined, let alone BC. Then you go and look at Australia, and you see that Australia has about the same uh, reserves as all of Canada. You go and look at China, and China has more than three times the, the shale gas reserves as all of Canada, not just BC, all of Canada. You go down to Mexico, and Me Mexico is about 50% bigger natural gas, shale gas reserves than Canada, and they're all over the place. So there's a lot around. Let's look at the production of shale gas in the U.S. as a function of time, from 2000 through to, I believe this is 2013. And you see an exponential increase here as a consequence of the discovery of horizontal fracking technology. It, 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 we've been fracking in British Columbia for over 50 years where a vertical hole is drilled, fluid is put down at high pressure, it cracks the shale and gas flows out. But with the introduction of the horizontal fracking technology, not only do you go down, you can go out in different directions and put the fluid under high pressure and frack to sure the shale and have more gas come out. And hence there's been a boom of gas production in the US and hence the price drop in North America. If we look then where natural gas is shipped from where to where around the world, and we look at red here, red is shipped by regular pipeline and blue is shipped by liquefied natural gas. And you look at the Asian market over here, you see a number of things. You see a number of blues here, and you see some emanating from Australia. That is, or Australia is already shipping like liquefied natural gas to Asia. You see some coming from Nigeria. You see some coming from the Middle East, etc. But you see nothing coming from, from this part of the world. If you see the US, you see the US is already importing liquefied natural gas from the Venezuelan air fields. And Canada is landlocked, and all its natural gas can, it really has to stay within the continent. But what's missing on this map is this one here this little arrow between Russia and China. And so why is that important? Well, let's actually now look at the global natural gas reserves, all forms of natural gas, and see where they are. When you look at it, you find that 60% of the global natural gas reserves are in three countries, Russia, Iran, and Qatar. Here's Canada. This is all of Canada, not just British Columbia, all of Canada. More than, Russia has more than 17 times the natural gas reserves of all of Canada combined. Yet Russia, can put in regular pipelines to China as opposed to liquefying and shipping it halfway across the world. So you start to get a sense of unease about this, so let's look at the reality here through recent newspaper articles that were written. Number one, China chases domestic shale. China is aggressively ch uh, chasing after its own shale gas reserves, which are greater than three, three times all of Canada's reserves. You've got Russia, Gazprom is their company, recently signing long-term deals to provide natural gas to, chi to China via regular pipelines. You've got the current price in North America, the same as the current price in Australia. And Australia is already shipping natural gas. And you have US gas via Panama frightening uh, LNG in my favorite newspaper, the National Post, which says the following, I'm joking. The United States is set to grab the first and biggest chunk of unfilled extra Asian demand for ship gas between now and 2025 with help from a wide Panama Canal and prices that rivals could match. America can start shipping LNG almost tomorrow because they already have import facilities on the coast that they just simply have to switch to export. It's a little, you know, it's not just turn the dial, but it can be done relatively rapidly. There are huge reserves around the world, but BC is one of many, many players. The reality, as put forward by Minister Bennett in a recent conference up in, in Fort St. John that I attended, was this. 
Obviously, as this develops and as, we, as companies make the final decision, probably not in 2014, su suppose it's possible, but more likely in 2015, and we pause there and reflect, and what does that mean? Despite the fact that we've heard multiple announcements many times, but so-and-so companies doing this, I don't know how many times I've heard about Petrotus is apparently building a plant. It's been announced at least three times. The reality is not a single company anywhere in the world has committed to build an LNG plant in British Columbia. And in fact, just yesterday, Minister Coleman on a telephone uh, press conference noted that in fact, companies have told him that they've invested up to a billion dollars in proposed LNG plants and never actually moved forward. We have no guarantee of anything yet in British Columbia. And the sad reality is, is we put all of our eggs in this one basket. And to build on that metaphor, I go to Preston Manning, who at the same conference said the following, in direct criticism of the BC government, we shouldn't count our chickens before the rooster even enters the hen house. <laughs> so that's the reality, the sad reality, and I'll come back to why I think that we should be going in a different direction in a second. So the second thing is now a little bit on the coast. And why this, I'm going to address this is we have in this province five conditions that have been put forward several times by the provincial government. And one of them says that so the provincial government requires world leading marine oil spill response prevention and recovery systems for BC's coastline and ocean to manage and mitigate the risks and costs of heavy oil pipelines and ship oil, shipping. Commitments. That's the only one I'll focus on. I was a little concerned when I read the mandate letter that was given to the Minister of Environment where it said that she was tasked with eliminating red tape so that we can get to yes on economic development without delay. And my concern with the fact that also in there was completion of the marine and land-based heavy spill oil responses was that getting to yes precluded no being an answer and so I specifically asked that. My question is, does that raise some concern that it's in some sense precluding an outcome of an environmental assessment if your mandate is to get to yes, as opposed to determining whether yes is an appropriate answer? And I was reassured by the answer there. And the answer is this. It doesn't because of the phrase without needless delay. So this is where I think we can hold the minister accountable. And I'll keep coming to that in a second. We have the Northern Gateway. I don't know how many ads are taking out, but one of the, one of the uh, um, op heads in the Vancouver Sun assured us, British Columbians, that we're working as hard as we can day and day to live up to the very high standards that have been set. And that, the, uh, according to the website, spill responses, spills are not inevitable, and the Northern Gateway has placed high priority on both the assessment of risks and the measures required to mitigate those risks, et cetera, et cetera. Now, okay, that's where we have it from the company's perspective, from my question to the minister. Now let's go and explore the actual submission by the province of British Columbia to the joint review panel of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Now I will say straight up, praise or praise is due, this was a superb submission, excellent and thorough analysis of the project, and they did an outstanding job representing of the interests of British Columbians, and I can't give enough superlatives to this submission to the joint review panel. Let me show you why. Right up front it says, trust me is not good enough. And that's a direct reference to the previous type comments about we're going to do great things and we're having your best interests at heart. They say th things here. In short, what Dilbin, which is diluted bitumen, will do when it enters water remains unclear. Northern Gateway recognizes lack of clarity itself, as was stated by one of its witnesses. It's extremely difficult to predict the behavior of this product. What does appear to be common ground is that Dilbert will sink if it becomes heavier than water. One way that this may occur is if it comes into contact with suspended sediments. In fact, Northern Gateway acknowledges that the fraction of the total oil volume that sinks can exceed 50% of the entrained oil. The province submits that requiring Northern Gateway to show now that it will in fact have the ability to respond effectively to a spill is particularly important because there will be no subsequent public process in which the ability can be probed and tested. That's very, very important. And there is serious reason to question Northern Gateway's ability to respond effectively to a spill. A number of experts representing Environment Canada and the DFO have, opinion, have, have the opinion that the effects of an oil spill into the marine environment can persist for decades. Therefore, at this time, the most reliable figures, there they are, before the Joint Review Panel indicate that in these seasons, there are significant periods during which spill response will be impossible or severely constrained. How can you have an effective response when it's impossible? The province submits that Northern Gateway has not shown that it will be able to establish a spill response regime capable of responding effectively to spills in the marine environments, let alone one that is world class. 
With this limited explanation and in the absence of supporting facts concerning the means by which the scaling factors were arrived at, there is simply no way in which the JRP could rely on the conclusions made in the quantitative risk assessment. However, the factual basis for these figures is entirely absent in the quantitative risk assessment. This is scaling. For this reason, the province is not able to support approval of the project and submits that its concerns respecting Northern Gateway's ability to respond to a spill should be given serious consideration by the JRP. I don't know how, how, how you can say no in clearer terms than this through the submission. But as we know, the Joint Review Panel only makes a recommendation to Cabinet, and Cabinet can overturn this, and I'll come to that in a second. Now, I started to get antsy when I read in my uh, national newsletter of the Canadian National uh, Committee for, for a Scientific, uh, well, it was Canadian National Committee of the Scientific Committee on Ocean Research, where buried within a newsletter was the following statement. A major initiative in, in planning is the Complementary Measures Project for the area surrounding Kitimat, British Columbia, to support planned oil tanker traffic. So I probed the minister with a few questions, et cetera, on that. But and they weren't really aware of it, what was going on. But through my friends who actually are DFO scientists and et cetera, who give me these documents, what I found out, in fact, in fact this is what's going on. This is what was going on prior to the election and prior to the BC's submission to the Joint Review Panel. Is the government invested, uh, made a commitment to invest a total of 120 million, this is the federal government, on a, a, world, on a so called world class oil spill response um, program, which is linked to with DFO, Environment Canada, Transport Canada, and Natural Resources Canada. And what's critical about this is that this was de designed to build a operational forecasting capacity for the conditions in and around Discovery Channel and Hecate Strait for specifically for oil tanker uh, flow. This is not kind of a, a do a research project. It's the development of an operational capacity, like you would develop a, wind, a weather forecasting capacity or like you might uh, develop a, you know, have, have a capacity for tugboats. This is a very sophisticated capacity that was being developed. And in, it, in, in the rationale, the budget submission that were actually put to Treasury Board nationally, it says the follow, following, behavior models specific to, to Dilbert do not exist, and existing commercial models for conventional oil do not allow parameter specific modifications. Translate that into to lay language, there is nothing out there that can give you any sense of what happens when you spill Dilbert in the water. That's simply what that's saying. There's no models and there's no, no, no data. So this project's there to actually have the feds step up, develop an operational capacity, coupled with hydro hydrographic measurements, DFOs meeting the Discovery Channel, taking ocean temperature and salinity measurements, with the goal of developing a capacity and an understanding of what would happen, what Dilbert went to the ocean. And they actually call this, if you look up here, the Northern Gateway Project, which is quite fascinating, involving questions, scoping questions from DFO about which shipping routes will have the most traffic, and of course, when you look at that, they're looking at Douglas Channel and, and, and these areas here. And Environment Canada is getting in here to talk about the complex waterways of interest from Kitimat to Hecate Strait. And they're talking about supporting industry through the provision of surface monitoring data and actually a, a technician to help them. So what is happening here is in recognition that there is no marine cap uh, uh, spill cap capability out there. The feds are stepping in to do precisely what industry should have done prior to the submission of the G G to the JRP using taxpayers' money. At the same time, <laughs> but at the same time as they closed the Ocean Contaminants Division of the Department of Fishery and Ocean throughout Canada. It's all closed. Last year, they closed the Marine Contaminants Division of DFO, and now they're doing this specific targeting to the Northern Gateway using $120 million of taxpayer money. The single largest injection uh, of, of project-specific funding DFO has had in, in years. But of course, Mr. Harper claims that He's claiming the, defending the independence of this project and, and says specifically that uh, the government does not pick uh, or choose particular projects and they have to be evaluated on their own merits. And you know, my, my cynical response there is of course, really. Which is, so, what, so this led me to, to come out specifically with a call to, to get the government to come out very clearly to say, to give an emphatic no to Northern Gateway. Not just no means no, no means no, not no means a pathway to yes. And we, we did two things, we did that, and in response to that, the Premier actually came up here and said something that I, I can't help but detect, sorry Scott, there's obviously a little thing in the front there that 
that is, is passive aggressive. But it says, the thing that the Green Party and my party have in common is this, we take a clear position and we stick with it. Their position is they don't support the expansion of heavy oil under any circumstances. They're clear and consistent about that. My position, there are five conditions, they must be met. And if they are not met, there will be no expansion of heavy oil in BC. Now what we're consistent about is science-driven policy, and the reason why is that we've actually called, given the evidence that, the, that they have submitted, that the province itself has submitted to the Joint Review Panel, there is no question that they should be calling for an immediate moratorium on all Dilbert being transported across our water. Many people don't... Many people don't realize that one tanker a week leaves the Burnaby facility through, right beside my riding, all the way along the coast of Oak Bay, Gordon Head, out to Asia, taking Dilbet to Asia for processing and refining there. That's happening now. That never used to happen when the first Kingdom Order pipeline was built because Dilbet was not a product that was shipped. But it, it was changed, what was in there changed as a function of time, such that yet yeah, there was never any public review process of that. So we have a sh shipping of Dilbit as we speak in our coastal waters. And if there were to be a spill, <coughs> based on the submission that <coughs> excuse me, the BC government made itself to the Joint Review Panel, there is simply impossible at times, or, and there's no knowledge, there's no existing scientific knowledge of what would happen. And my, what I've thrown out to the Premier, and I'm yet to get a response to this, is what would happen if a heavy oil, a bitumen tanker, were to somehow break up in Vancouver Harbor? Think about the economic consequences to Vancouver, the city apparently in the best place on earth, which we've been branded by the previous, uh, previous and liberal administrations. But I don't just like to say no, I like to say where should we be heading? So I'm going to give an, an, an opposite approach here that I think we could be doing and should be doing. And I'm going to do that in the context of this one figure here. This figure showing three panels uh, in one column and three panels in the other. The first column shows projected mean temperature change around the world in the years 2020 through 2029 average. And in the other column, it's over the decade 2019 to 2099. And the three rows, the top row shows projected emissions with relatively benign growth in, in greenhouse gases. And the bottom shows emissions growth that's rather aggressive. Uh, you know, you find the fossil fuels and you burn it. And what it shows if you look at the first three panels is it's very difficult to discern any difference with them. That is, each of them shows about the same warming of about 0.2 degrees per decade. Yet, the type of warming we get at the latter part of the century fundamentally depends on the emissions tra tra trajectories we take. Translate that again today, the decisions we make today will not affect those who are making the decisions, but it will affect those in the next generation who are not here to be part of the decision making. So, you, if you ask them, of course, they might say you should be making these decisions. If you ask us, we have a legitimate societal debate. Do we, the present generation, believe we owe anything to future generations? It's a legitimate question that needs to be addressed. Because if we don't, then this issue of global warming is irrelevant because the policy decisions we make today will not affect those making them. But if we believe they do, and I'm pretty sure the next generation will believe we do, then those people making the decisions today have a responsibility to make the right decisions because the decisions they make will manifest themselves out in the next generation. That is the type of world that we inherit fundamentally depends on the decisions we make today. And, and this is ultimately why I decided to actually give up a rather cushy career in the university and take a 50% salary cut, is to be perfectly blunt, I don't think people are doing that. I think that they're standing up and they're thinking about decisions that will ensure re-election four years from now. Let me just say that suppose that my riding happens to be Parksville Qualicum, which is the oldest demographic in all of British Columbia. I, 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 and I, I live here for a lot of the year, not a lot of the year, for quite some time in the summer, so I, I feel I can make these comments. Um, an issue that might affect people in Parksville Qualicum, is certainly something that I'm thinking about, is lineups for hip and knee replacements because of the age of the community. <laughs> I mean, I, I need a knee for my, my rugby, and I've been living in pain with my knee for quite some time, and I don't want to wait three years to get my knee replacement. So I might think and look for a politician who will stand up and say, I will build a hospital. And four years later, I'll point to that hospital and say, look, I've listened to you. I've responded to your needs. There's a hospital. You're, there's an Oceanside Health Center. There, you're, you're um, right across from the house I have. There, you're, uh, it's all set up for the future. <laughs> you, you're, <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. We listen to you, three years later you vote for me, I respond to your concerns, great. Now you have somebody puts in an aggressive carbon pricing, 
whose dis results will not manifest itself for decades to come. And at the next election, all you can say is, look, I've done this, but you can't see any effect of it. Trust me, it was the right thing because I listened to the experts in the diversity of the communities. That's the, therein lies a political problem here, is that people in our political realms are frankly too often thinking about the short-term consequences of their decisions and not the long-term consequences. So that, so that fundamentally then, global warming is an issue of intergenerational equity, and the solution is all there, and they fall into three categories. Behavioral, technological, and what I believe is critical is the market instruments. And I'll illustrate that I've only got, I know, just two slides after this. The tragedy of the commons. Let's suppose that we have public lands where you have cows grazing on that land. And the cows are owned by individual farmers, but the land is public and owned by everybody. It's owned by the public. And let's suppose you do a cost-benefit analysis as an individual farmer as to whether or not you should put a cow on that land. Well, you do the cost-benefit analysis and you realize the costs of overgrazing are distributed amongst everybody. And the benefits of putting that cow up on the land are given solely to you. Cost-benefit analysis, it's to my advantage to put a cow on the land. But it's, in fact, to every farmer's advantage to put a cow on the land. And so if they're all doing their cost-benefit analysis from them, their own perspective, there's only one solution. Too many cows on the land collapse because of overgrazing. Now, if we bring that into the climate problem, the commons is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is shared by everybody. The impacts are, of climate change are distributed amongst everybody. The costs of action are borne by a country. So it's in every country's best interest to do nothing because the costs of, the costs of action are borne by the country and the costs of inaction are distributed globally. By corollary, it's in every province's best interest to do nothing. It's in every city and every province's best interest to do nothing. It's in every municipality and every city and every province and every country's best interest to do nothing. It's in every household, in every municipality, in every city, in every province, in every country, in the world's best interest to do nothing. And it's in every individual, in every household, in every municipality, in every city, in every province, in every country, in the world's best interest to do absolutely nothing about this problem because the costs of action are borne by the individual and the costs of inaction are distributed among seven billion people. So how would you deal with this? Well, it's simple in the farmer's case. You might decide to elect a council, a benevolent council, and they might decide to regulate the number of cows. They might realize that 100 cows could be supported on that land. And because you ran in the Green Party, you could put four cows on, and because you're with the Liberal, you get no cows of NDP. Well, I'll give you one cow on the NDP. And, and you're married to my sister, you get five cows. You could regulate heavily. And, and of course, industry typically does not like heavy regulation, and society generally doesn't, but it may play a role. You might cap the number of cows and say, we know that this land can support 100 cows. And then let the farmers bid on, uh, bid on the rights to have a cow and trade amongst themselves. This is precisely what's done with taxi cabs in, in cities, is you have a finite number of taxi cabs and the taxi drivers bid on the right to trade and sell them amongst themselves to avoid the tragedy of the commons collapse in terms of capsi, ca taxi uh, fares and prices and, and cabs available. You could also put a head tax on and raise the tax to control the number of cows. And the analogies are direct with global warming. Regulation, what's called cap and trade, you cap the emissions and you allow companies to trade them. Or carbon tax, you put a price on the emissions. The latter two are equivalent to actually putting a price on emissions. In this case, you, in the cap and trade, you control the emissions or you let the market determine the price. In the carbon tax, you control the, 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 the tax and you let the market determine how much emissions that leads. Too. In British Columbia, we had in 2011 a report written by KPMG which analyzed what's called the clean tech sector, the sector that's involved in the generation, transportation, storage, and end use of renewable energy. And it pointed out that there were 202 British uh, clean tech organizations, organizations in BC with revenue that had increased dramatically from 2008 to 2011, which employed 8,400 people with an average salary of 77,000 jobs, and which was actually described as tre a tremendous opportunity for growth and worth encouraging and promoting globally as it creates high paying jobs and investment opportunities for British Columbians. This was a report, uh, and this, uh, this industry th thrived largely as a direct consequence of the portfolio of policies that were introduced. 
The U.S. recognized this and through stimulus funding injected millions and millions of dollars into this industry. Instead of building roads and bridges, they invested heavily into the clean tech sector so that now there's 3.4 million green energy jobs making up 2.6% of all employ employment, which has increased four times faster than the average increase rate of all jobs from 2010 to 2011 and has, has attracted dramatic, res uh, uh, um, dramatic investment. I firmly believe that actually this is a very, very, truly exciting age of innovation for the youth of today. We're at a pivotal juncture which will make the energy evil, uh, revolution of the industrial age, back when James Watt was discovering the steam engine, pale in comparison. We're seeing growth in the U.S. at least in the green building sector. That's been exponential. It's thought to increase, uh, to take up as much as 38% of market share by the year 2016. We're beginning to see the emergence of the electrification of the transportation sector. We're seeing certain jurisdictions recognizing the opportunity of the clean tech sector. And just recently, Quebec announced that it, it was going to make a major investment, a stimulus to try to get its economy going by, by, by stimulating this, this part of the economy. And we have an example here at home in British Columbia. We have the site seat down. Everybody is, we're hearing about that in the paper. The BC Hydro is saying, we have to build the site seat down. That's all we can do. But what I'm saying and what a clean tech industry is saying is, hang on there. What's wrong with taking advantage of our other natural resources? We currently have existing wonderful batteries. These are the existing dams, which were built using capital funds from our predecessors under W.A.C. Bennett and previous uh, pr premiers when they used capital money from 50 years ago to build dams that are giving us cheap power today. These dams could actually be used as batteries that can be recharged by other forms of renewable which are intermittent in source. And these new forms of renewable are far cheaper to build than the old style form of big dam, big construction, flood, class one agricultural lands as is proposed here. And there's new technologies like high voltage DC lines which are emerging that allow for the long distance transportation with lower transmission loss of electricity. Just a couple of weeks ago, a British Columbia company called Seabreeze announced that it was willing to, to put in place a high voltage DC line between, U, uh, between Victoria and the US. And if, and only if, it would cost free, not a penny for the British Columbians, BC Hydro were willing to enter into a 10 to 12 year agreement to buy electricity at 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour. They would build a free HVDC line to the US if BC Hydro would enter into a commitment to buy 6.9 cent kilowatt hour electricity. Now that's the price that we pay for the first little bit of electricity we use in our household. That is way lower than you can get for any new capacity. Why we're not doing it, I have no idea. We've actually, well I do know, because BC Hydro is, is a, well I don't want to get into that as another hour talk. Um, we, we have in the last few years taken technologies like the wireless technologies from nothing to everyone having a cell phone, and if you're an MLA, you have two because you have to have your personal and the other one. Everybody has a laptop. Even our kids have laptops now. They didn't exist 25 years ago or, or in the early 1980s. There were no laptops back then. We've put men on the moon, and we could put women on the moon if we actually tried, but we could. But we haven't, but we could. We've done amazing, amazing uh, uh, advances in technology. Yet I challenge you to think of any, any piece of technology out there that is essentially invariant in about 100 years, apart from the internal combustion engine, wherein we take the product out of the ground, we transport it, we refine it, we put it in, in, a, in an engine, and we light it on fire and move moving parts up and down to drive an engine. This is the technology of the Ford Model T that is largely unchanged in the vehicles we drive today. And I, I argue it is not because of an inability for us to innovate, but it's an inability for us to move away from entrenched technologies because of vested interests, which are always at play to stop us from moving there. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.